owns the patent on this vaccine? The people, I, I would say. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? Could you patent the sun? Who owns the patent on this vaccine? The people, I, I would say. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? Who owns the patent on this vaccine? It's for the people. I think that is an answer to that myth. <laughs> Who owns the patent on this vaccine? It's for the people. I think that is an answer to that myth. <laughs> Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? Who owns the patent on this vaccine? It's for the people. Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? Who owns the patent on this vaccine? It's for the people. Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? There is no patent. There is no patent. There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? Who owns the patent on this vaccine? It's for the people. I think that is an answer to that myth. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? It's for the people. I think that is an answer to that myth. Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Could you patent the sun? Pat, patent the sun? There is no patent. There is no patent. There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? So welcome everybody to this rally for the People's Vaccine Alliance. Amazing to see so many people signed up from all over the place. I was just looking at all the messages. So uh, my name is Max Lawson. I'm the chair uh, this evening. Um, I'm the chair of the People's Vaccine Alliance overall. I also work for Oxfam as the head of policy. And it's a real privilege to be chairing these amazing speakers tonight. Uh, let me just say a little bit about the issue. So, I mean, we put a press release out this morning where we worked out that while rich nations are vaccinating one person a second, uh, the majority of the poorest countries have yet to get a single dose. So you have this um, incredible vaccine apartheid going on across the world. And I think the key message for the People's Vaccine campaign is not that anyone in the North should be feeling guilty or thinking that they shouldn't be vaccinated. My mum got vaccinated just a couple of weeks ago and the hope, the freedom from fear, the freedom from the fear of this disease that vaccine can bring should be the same hope for everyone all over the world. And the key to doing that is to face down the monopolies and the profits of huge pharmaceutical giants who are artificially rationing the supply of vaccines. We have a situation where a small number of companies is getting to decide who lives and who dies. So there's a huge struggle going on out there, an amazing uh, moment in history, if you like, where we need to fight for a people's vaccine, not a profit vaccine. And tomorrow is a key moment because there's a meeting at the WTO, the World Trade Organization, where a hundred developing countries have called for a waiver on intellectual property. That means that the monopolies of the pharmaceutical companies would be overruled for four or five years 
uh, for all vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. That would enable uh, vaccine producers all over the world to rapidly scale up the production of safe and effective vaccines, to flood the world with medicines and vaccines that work. And so we can get this disease under control and get our world uh, into a better place. So uh, we're calling on companies to join the various mechanisms, to join the uh, pool at the WHO for sharing their technology. So far, they've completely refused. In fact, the head of Pfizer described it as nonsense. Um, so we have a struggle. And I think the only thing that will make uh, these pharmaceutical giants move is public pressure. We saw opinion polls in the last week in France, Germany, the UK, on average, 75 to 80% of the public believe that these patents and monopolies should be overruled because of the pandemic. So the public really want this to happen. So we have to fight for it to happen. And tomorrow we're going to see uh, a day of action to mark this uh, anniversary. It's a year since the pandemic was declared. What an insane year it's been. And it's also this meeting at the WTO uh, to discuss this this push from South Africa and India to waive patents, which is being blocked by rich nations, by Boris Johnson, by Emmanuel Macron, by Chancellor Merkel and by Joe Biden at the moment. Uh, they would rather defend the patents and the profits of their companies than uh, vaccinate the world. So um, it's a real struggle and it's going on as we speak. So the purpose of this uh, uh, rally and the day of action tomorrow is to really keep that pressure up so we're going to be sharing in the chat the link to the website for the day of action there's lots of individual actions you can take whether it's tweeting politicians or chasing changing your facebook profile or getting more involved so we'd really encourage you to check out that website and get involved and, and really get behind fighting for this people's vaccine and the purpose of this rally is really to inform to inspire and we want to mobilize people to stand up against this vaccine apartheid and inspire you all to take action tomorrow, get your friends to take action, uh, just spread the word because the more pressure we put on politicians in the next two or three months, the more chance we have of having a breakthrough on this issue. And I really believe we can. I think this is a moment in history we will look back on years from now and we will say we managed to win the fight over the profitable companies and in favor of the people. So we have an amazing and exciting list of speakers. We've had, as you would expect, uh, with a, an event like this, some last minute changes. Uh, Grassa Michelle, due to unforeseen circumstances, she hasn't been able to join, but she's sent a written message, which I'm gonna read. Uh, Senator Ivan Cepeda, who was also not able to join, he sent us a video message. Um, uh, but very, very exciting. We have got a last minute addition um, Bernie Sanders has uh, recorded a message for us and so has Representative Jan Schakowsky. So that's fantastic. And just finally, before we get into the speakers, uh, hopefully you heard the, the music at the beginning. That's a, uh, that, that's a, a, a song that's out tomorrow. It's uh, uh, been put together by a guy called DJ Shalant in America. And that was like a, a, a kind of preview. That sample, when you could, he's talking about patenting the sun, it's worth pointing who that is. That's a famous uh, scientist from the 1950s. He invented the vaccine uh, against polio. His name was Jonas Salk. And uh, because of him, polio was basically uh, virtually eradicated worldwide. And he famously said, why would I patent it? Would you, would you want to patent the sun? And he's gone down in, 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 in history as a, a real hero who wanted science to be freely available and open to all. So that's what that song is, is, is harking back to. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is an activist rally. And so each speaker will have between three and four minutes. Um, sadly, due to the, the full lineup and the, the, so many of you, we won't have time for questions from the floor. But we do have a team of people, Heidi, James, Anna, on hand who can answer any questions about the issues uh, on the chat. So if you do have any questions, do, do post them and, and, and they'll try and answer them in real time. Um, and you can always uh, correspond with us afterwards if you feel that we haven't answered any of your questions or got back to you. And please tweet uh, uh, if you're on Twitter using uh, the hashtag 
people's vaccine to keep uh, keep up the pressure uh, on the issue during the rally. Great. OK, so without further ado, we'll get started. So um, first of all, as I said, Grass and Michelle was going to record us a video. She was unable to. Um, so I'm going to read out a short message from her and then we'll get into the other speakers. So this is a message from Grassa. Um, she's the woman who, an amazing woman. Anyway, so human lives are equal in value, no matter the geographic lottery of birthplace. Everyone, I repeat, everyone, every single human being, no matter where they live in the world, needs and deserves access to life-saving vaccine. Vaccine nationalism is a moral catastrophe. History will judge us harshly should we not marshal every resource at our disposal and stretch the bounds of our imaginations to make sure we get vaccines in the arms of those who need it, from Maputo to Mexico City to Mumbai. We must act with collective responsibility and solidarity as a human family to ensure each one of us is able to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Dare not let us be the ones to deny ourselves and generations to come the dignity of sound health and life and victory over COVID-19. Powerful message from Grasser to open the discussion. Right, now we're going to move straight into the speakers. Now, first speaker, I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Sonia Adesara, who's a medical doctor and activist. She was the National Medical Director's Clinical Fellow in 2018-29 and she's a former co-chair of the Young Medical Women's International Association. So Dr. Sonia, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I think my experiences over the past year, I think many health workers across the world will relate to. Um, so I work in the NHS, which is a, you know, a world-class healthcare system, and yet it very quickly became overwhelmed. Um, and many hospitals, including my own, we frequently ran out of beds, ran out of ventilators. And it's a, it's a very, it's a really frightening place to be in when you have three, four, five very sick people um, struggling to breathe. And you know, you only have one ITU bed free. And as a doctor, you are, you are, you are used to dealing with sickness and you are used to dealing with death, but it is, it is different and it is very difficult when you know that the suffering you're seeing and, and the deaths that you've seen could have been prevented. And as a healthcare worker, I also know that it is irrelevant who someone is or where they come from or what they do. Um, because in healthcare, in healthcare, we treat every person the same. We know that every life is of value and every life deserves to be protected and cared for. Um, and as someone who has also lost a colleague and a family member due to this virus, it makes me so um, upset and angry that we have this incredible, you know, scientific miracle of the knowledge of how to protect lives now with this vaccine. And yet, we know that on the current system, 90% to the majority of those in the poorest countries will not be protected, will not be vaccinated this year. Now, people are calling this a vaccine apartheid. Um, I, I don't think I have the words to articulate a system where millions across the world will needlessly die um, simply to maintain a system that ensures a few individuals are able to extract maximum profit from this crisis. And it makes me even more ashamed to know that some of the wealthiest countries in the world, including my own, have undermined global initiatives to improve access to vaccines in poorer countries. So they have knowingly um, and deliberately prolonging the suffering of those in the, the most, those with the least means um, in, in, our, in our world. Um, and I think, you know, I, I guess I'm now speaking directly to people watching in the UK um, and the US and in Europe. Our silence here is complicity because we have a voice and we have the power to put pressure on our governments to support the People's Vaccine Initiative, to waive the intellectual property rights, which will allow this knowledge um, 
and the technology of how to make these vaccines to be shared openly and that, that could allow the massive upscaling of production of vaccines across the world and save millions and billions of lives and um, and we also need to you know quite loudly remind our governments and um, particularly those of us um in the west that vaccine nationalism and this you know economic nationalism as some may call it is not only a moral failure but it is stupidly short-sighted because as we know if you allow the virus to let rip to let spread in certain countries then that increases the risk of mutations and that increases the risk of our vaccine then becoming ineffective so i think you know to finish i feel you know sometimes it can feel it can feel maybe that we've got a bit of an impossible task and um, we are going against a system which has you know massive vested interests in maintaining the status quo but we also need to remember our very recent history where hiv activists fought against big pharma and they won so we need to not underestimate the power of people organizing that's our power and then we also we have to remind ourselves that we will face future pandemics and the multiple crises that we now face in the world of um, climate breakdown, of rising inequality, all of these, the solutions to this is global solidarity and collaboration. We need our governments to have the strength and the integrity to take on these big corporations. And we need to end this rigged system that puts profit before people's lives. And we need to demand a system that's based on fairness, um, and transparency and democratic global governments that prioritizes our health and puts people's lives before profit. So let's support, let's demand a people's vaccine um, because no one's life is disposable. Thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, uh, Sonia, that was amazing. And just respect to you and all the amazing health workers uh, all over the world putting their lives on the line. I think we all saw the figures from Amnesty uh, last week about how many health workers have died in this pandemic and it's just truly heroic. Uh, for the next speaker, we're gonna hear from Representative Jan Schakowsky, who sits in Congress in the US, representing the 9th District of Illinois. In 2010, Speaker Pelosi appointed her to serve on President Obama's National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. And in Congress, she focuses on healthcare and senior issues. As director of the Illinois State Council of Senior Citizens, she organized across the state for lower cost prescription drugs and tax relief for seniors. So now we're gonna hear from the representative. Hi, it's Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. And at first I wanna thank you for the fight that you're in, and I am proud to be your partner. The, the Biden administration has said that we are at war, and they're right. We're in a world war against the virus. But unfortunately, we have vaccine apartheid in this world. And it's not out of the goodness of our heart that we need to make sure that countries all over the globe are able to access vaccines. It's because if those uh, viruses are existing anywhere, we are in danger everywhere. So it's in our own self-interest. And what we know is that poor countries have asked for the opportunity through a short-term waiver during the time of the virus to be able to produce their own vaccines and they have gone to the World Trade Organization asking for a waiver from the TRIPS agreement to do just that. You know that, but where have you read about it? Where have you seen, about, seen anything about it? And so our job is to lift this issue, create some urgency around it. And what I'm asking you to do on behalf of ourselves and the many, many countries that don't, haven't had even one single vaccine in their arm to help get as many members of Congress to sign the letter to the President of the United States asking him to support the waiver for these countries. And I assure you that if the, our President does that, 
that the few other countries that are opposing it. And by the way, who benefits from this? Let's be clear. The um, big pharma companies want to protect their intellectual property. And that is why they are pressing hard against this agreement. We need to overcome that. I have a letter that's going to the President of the United States. We need the signatures of as many members of Congress as we can. And so I need you to put this on the agenda of all my colleagues quickly and get them to sign the letter. That's my big ask. That's all I can do. And with your help, we can make this happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Brilliant. And we saw just, uh, I think last week, a letter from 200 leading uh, uh, influential people all over the US to President Biden, huge pressure on him to do the right thing, but obviously huge pressure on him from the pharmaceutical industry too. Next, we're gonna hear from Baba Aye, who is uh, from Public Services uh, International. Now, PSI is the kind of union of unions for health workers and public sector workers. Um, great comrade and friend. He has an international master's in labor policies and globalization. And he's an activist of over three decades fighting for a better world where development brightens the lives of the many and not just the 1%. Great intro. So Baba, over to you. Thank you. When Dr. Gebreyesus of the WHO declared that the COVID-19 public health emergency could be considered a pandemic a year ago, there were 118,000 cases in 114 countries and 4,291 lives had been lost. Today, we've had 118 million cases, more than two and a half million lives have been lost and the pandemic is as global as global can be. Vaccines are an important way of stopping the pandemic in its tracks. But just as the COVID-19 pandemic itself both revealed and sharpened inequalities between and within countries, the current regime of distribution and administration of vaccine doses shows that the corporations and rich countries are putting profit before people and wealth before health. This is immoral as well as politically and economically criminal. About 115 billion US dollars in public funds have gone into the development of these vaccines, as well as know-how from public institutions. Yet, Pfizer and BioNTech alone stand to gain not less than 13 billion US dollars from this vaccine. This has to stop. This is part of why we are calling for joining the call for a waiver of intellectual property rights. That is just a part of it, because even with the waiver of IP rights, there will still be countries that would need solidarity to ensure that vaccines are available to everybody everywhere at no cost. This can be easily done including with tax justice. There are companies, particularly those providing digital services that have made billions in this period. We should tax the rich. What we see with the undermining of vaccine equity is part of what has been the case the past three decades of neoliberal globalization, where the spirit of 45 is being whittled where continually public services are being undermined, where people's health are not considered as primary. We need to fight back to build a better world. We need a radical new economy. We need a radical new approach to ensuring that people come before profits. 
And that is part of why PSI stands solidly with the People's Vaccine Alliance as a part of the alliance, as well as for struggle to change the current situation, just as our forebears fought to win the spirit of 45. Amandla, our way to. Thank you, Baba. That was amazing. Uh, fantastic. And I think you make a key point there uh, that these vaccines were funded by public money. They are public property. And it's not said enough in the media, this idea that these clever companies have risked everything to design these vaccines for us is a lie. They were designed by public money, by public scientists, and they are not private property. Right, let's move on to the next speaker uh, from Indonesia. Neti Heriwan is a member of parliament in Indonesia, representing uh, the party, the PKS, I won't try and pronounce that, um, and a member of the Health Commission. She's also the chairperson of PKS COVID-19 team and wrote her party's white paper on handling the COVID-19 pandemic. So over to Neti. Kesehatan dan kehidupan adalah hak setiap manusia di seluruh dunia. Dilindungi oleh semua konstitusi dan tidak boleh ada yang menghalangi untuk mendapatkan akses tersebut. Di masa pandemi yang tidak jelas ujungnya, kapan akan berakhir, kebutuhan akan public health seperti layanan kesehatan, obat, dan vaksin semakin tak terhindarkan untuk semua negara tanpa terkecuali. Multiplier effect pandemi COVID-19 juga berimbas pada memburuknya kondisi ekonomi negara di seluruh dunia. Keterbatasan akses dan sumber daya menjadi penghalang bagi banyak negara miskin dan berkembang untuk memperoleh obat dan vaksin COVID-19 karena penelitian, pengembangan, dan produksi pengadaan vaksin masih didominasi oleh segelintir negara maju dan perusahaan farmasi besar dunia. TRIPS Agreement menjadi satu batu sandungan dalam memperoleh hak tersebut, yaitu hak kesehatan dan kehidupan. Karena kesepakatan ini menetapkan proteksi atas paten dan kekayaan intelektual dalam perdagangan internasional. Namun, semangat deklarasi Doha bahwa TRIPS Agreement harus diinterpretasi dengan tujuan to protect public health and to promote access to medicine for all harus terwujud. Oleh karena itu, saya dengan mendasarkan pada kemanusiaan dan menjaga kehidupan umat manusia, mendorong Indonesia untuk memberikan dukungan pada proposal TRIPS waiver agar tidak terjadi konglomerasi dan monopoli terhadap vaksin dan obat COVID-19 yang mengakibatkan ketimpangan akses obat dan vaksin bagi masyarakat dunia. Salus Populi Suprema Lex Exto. That's great. And I think there's a, there's a key point there. Uh, I think often this is framed as, as, you know, a story between rich countries and the poorest countries, but this is not just about rich countries and the poorest countries. It's about rich countries and the rest of the world. We're talking about huge populous nations like Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico. I saw some horrible scenes recently about the oxygen running out in Mexico, huge numbers of people suffering, and the vaccines are unaffordable and unavailable for virtually every country on earth. So now we're going to hear from um, uh, Winnie Bian Yima. Uh, this People's Vaccine Campaign, I think we can fairly say, was, was more or less her idea. Um, so she's the founder of the People's Vaccine. She's the executive director of UNAIDS, um, and uh, she leads the, the United Nations efforts to end the AIDS epidemic by 2030. And as we heard at the beginning, there's huge parallels in terms of the fight against pharmaceuticals for free and safe uh, medicines for HIV and the struggle we're now having uh, with uh, COVID-19. Um, she has uh, recorded a video, but we've uh, subtitled it because it's quite poor quality. She's traveling at the moment. I think she was in Nigeria today. So we're going to hear from uh, Winnie uh, now. Thank <laughs> you. 
to the People's Vaccine Rally. This is how change happens. You are how change happens. I'm Winnie Bianima. I lead the United Nations fight against AIDS. We, the communities fighting AIDS, we know the cost in lives when life-saving medicine is held up by patents and a refusal to share technology and know-how by putting profits before lives and everything else. And we know too how fair access can be secure. It is never given, it is always won. We are starting to see progress on our TV screens. In the last month, rich nations were vaccinating their citizens at a rate of one person per second. And now, some deliveries to developing countries have begun. But right now, the majority of developing countries have been unable to administer a single dose of a COVID vaccine. And only 3% of people in developing countries can hope to be vaccinated by the middle of this year. Meanwhile, opinion polls in rich countries show that more than two-thirds of the citizens in those countries agree that governments should ensure that vaccine science and know-how is shared with qualified manufacturers around the world rather than being monopolized by a handful of pharmaceutical giants in their countries. Qualified vaccine producers all over the world stand ready to produce more vaccines if they are allowed access to the technology and know-how that's now being held under lock and key by these companies. We don't have time to wait. Over 17,000 health workers have died in the past year. We don't have time to wait. Waiting helps the virus to spray, to mutate, and to become even more dangerous. The World Health Organization has told the world the new head of the WTO has told the world, the time is now. We're not asking for charity, we're demanding for justice. Sign the petition, lobby your leaders, tell your friends, you are lifesavers. Keep pressing, through the power of people, we will win. Support the call by the United Nations Secretary General for a vaccine that is a global public good, that is a people's vaccine. Thank you. Brilliant. That was the uh, amazing Winnie Bianima. Um, I didn't mention, but she was also my boss for a long time. And uh, I think she's the only boss I've ever had who knows how to accurately fire an AK-47 because she also fought for the liberation of Uganda. So she's really quite a scary lady uh, and an amazing woman. So great to hear from Winnie. Right, now we're going to hear from uh, Isabel uh, Jenny French. She's a writer and campaigner who specializes health in health and culture. As someone with an invisible illness, she wants to fight for an accessible and accommodating society for disabled people. She campaigns on access to medicines in the NHS and the National Health Service in the UK uh, with a focus on health inequality and injustice as a just treatment leader. So Isabel, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me. So I have cystic fibrosis, which places me into the clinically extremely vulnerable and high risk category. So I've been shielding for almost a year now. Um, so I haven't left my home and I haven't seen most of my friends and family at all. This has taken a massive toll on my physical and mental health because I've had I've had to spend most of the pandemic managing my health from home because my cystic fibrosis ward turned into the COVID ward at my hospital. Three weeks ago, I was lucky enough to have my first dose of the COVID vaccine, but it was bittersweet. 
I am so lucky and privileged to be able to have it. And I was excited that I'm now one step closer to hopefully holding my nan again. But it angers me that I got access to the vaccine before a lot of my family in India who haven't been able to leave their flats and homes for a whole year. I shouldn't have access to the vaccine before them. It's disgusting and unfair. Our lives in the West are not more valuable than the rest of the world. To be honest, I feel guilty that I got the vaccine before them. Everybody should be able to access a vaccine no matter where they live. And my life is not worth more than theirs. And it upsets me that they're left waiting for a first dose while I'm counting the weeks until I'll get my second. And now we've learned that some of the vaccines that India are making for poorer countries are being redirected to increase supplies in the West. The UK already got preferential access to the vaccine and bought up large supplies of vaccine candidates, even before they were proven to be effective, which left low and middle income countries with nothing. Now they're taking away the supplies that have been produced for these poorer countries too. It's unfair and we must have equitable global access. After all, it is a global pandemic, but millions of people across the world will not get access to a vaccine anytime soon. This is because 75% of global COVID vaccinations have taken place in just 10 countries and 130 countries are yet to receive a single dose. This isn't okay. Big Pharma are profiting off these vaccines, which have been developed with billions of pounds of public money, while people are still dying without access. How can they profit while others are suffering and dying? This could have been prevented if they just shared their knowledge. It's sickening and it's happened before time and again. Just look at the AIDS crisis and how people struggled. And in many countries, people continue to struggle for access to life-saving medications while big pharma companies profit and we can't let it continue. We cannot allow market forces to continue to dictate the value of lives. So this is why at Just Treatment, we are part of the People's Vaccine Alliance and why we'll be taking part in the People's Vaccine of Action tomorrow, the day tomorrow. Without widespread global vaccination, further mutations and strains of COVID threaten to undermine the UK's response. None of us are safe until everybody is safe. So let's make sure Big Pharma hear our, cru our crucial message. Thank you for listening. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, the fight for, for just treatment is a really amazing one in the UK. So great to, great to uh, hear from you there, Isabel. Um, Fatima Hassan is a human rights lawyer and social justice activist and the founder of the Health Justice Initiative. She is the former executive director of the Open Society Foundation for, Southern, for South Africa and has dedicated her professional life uh, to defending and promoting human rights in South Africa, particularly in the field of HIV AIDS, where she worked for the AIDS Law Project and also acted for the Treatment Action Campaign in many of its legal cases. The Treatment Action Campaign was at the forefront of the fight for, uh, against pharmaceuticals for, for access to treatment for HIV. So Fatima, over to you. Thank you and good evening. So I'm speaking to you from Cape Town, South Africa on a continent where most people are still waiting for a vaccine and most healthcare workers on our continent have not been vaccinated. And I want to stress four points this evening at the activist rally. The first is that it's unbelievable that we are here again in the middle of a pandemic and a public health crisis where vaccines are still not being treated as a public good and unfortunately continue to be treated as a commodity, as if it's a piece of jewelry, as if it's a PlayStation or a car, that's just unacceptable. Even after we know what this approach resulted in at the height of the AIDS crisis, which basically left lots of premature suffering and loss of death needlessly, including our own colleagues, friends and family members. And we simply can't have a repeat of that situation with COVID. In South Africa, the People's Vaccine Campaign of South Africa, which I'm part of, have just written today to various front-runner vaccine manufacturer companies that may supply the vaccines to South Africa and the region. We're demanding that they act with more transparency, that they are accountable to the public in South Africa and the region, and that they start sharing their vaccine know-how to scale up manufacturing on an urgent basis in the global south. We want information shared with the public. 
We need to prevent profiteering and hoarding in a pandemic because we have been here with HIV before and it doesn't really bode well for public health or for our, you know, our continued livelihoods. It's having a devastating socioeconomic impact in Africa and elsewhere. And we really want to stress that these drug companies are not God. They should not be playing God. They should not be deciding who gets access and who doesn't. And they need to show us and disclose as a matter of urgency, all the terms and conditions of all their licensing and all of their prices, because we're simply not going to accept a situation where we pay more for vaccines in Africa than people are paying in the EU or in Australia or in Canada. The third point I'd like to make is that Winnie and the Senator and many people who have spoken before me, and thank you, Isabel, for your courage and your honesty and your solidarity, is that the movement to break down intellectual property and patent protections is gaining momentum. And people are scared of that. Vested interests are scared of that. Even the global scientific and public health community at the Croy conference at the moment, right now, are currently signing on to a declaration where they are not supporting vaccine apartheid and not supporting vaccine inequity in the world. Even the United Nations, the WHO, UNAIDS, the Vatican, civil society around the world, trade unions, individuals, faith leaders, people like Tony Fauci are calling, are begging drug companies basically and rich countries to stop blocking the TRIPS waiver, to relax intellectual property protections and to be on the right side of history. And so we have three messages for them. Stop the hoarding, start sharing, stop blocking the TRIPS waiver. And, and you're correct, somebody pointed this out in the chat that the TRIPS waiver is more than just about patents. It's about all intellectual property protections. So finally, we're calling on the 10 very wealthy nations that are blocking the TRIPS waiver, including the UK government, the US, the EU, Australia, Japan, Canada, Brazil, Switzerland, who are all of our trade partners in Africa, and some of whom are actually our colonizers previously, to appreciate the public health and moral crisis that we are in. Multinationals and governments cannot hold the world to hostage and to ransom any longer. It must stop, because the risk is that millions of black and brown people's lives are now at stake and are now in their hands in the global south. So really we are urging these countries and their trade representatives and their ambassadors and the people who work in these governments to stop blocking the waiver. History will remember each one of you. History will remember every CEO, every trade minister, every prime minister, every leader that blocked the TRIPS waiver and history will not be kind to you because you will be perpetuating an inequity which is costing human lives. People really have to become, you know, have to come before profit there has to be a prioritization because no one is safe until everyone is safe. And that the current situation and status quo that we have is that global immunity is now at severe risk. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. That was fantastic. Um, and I hope, I hope somehow that the CEOs uh, of, of these pharmaceutical companies hear your words because I think they should be squirming you know they really should be squirming and there is something really colonial about all of this some of the recent things we've heard about kind of how their new clever technologies are just too complicated for developing countries and you know we've heard it all before and underlying it i think is is, is a is a racism i really do um let's move on to uh our next speaker perpetual afori and pofo i hope i said that right um, is a deputy uh, chief health tutor at the Nursing and Midwifery Training College in Ghana. She is a foundation fellow of the Ghana College of Nurses and Midwives and a fellow of the West African College of Nurses and Midwives. She has served as the general secretary of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association from January 2012 to the present day, representing the interests of nurses and midwives at the local and international level. So Perpetual, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I must say that I have graduated from the general secretary position to the president of the association. So I bring you greetings from my comrades in Ghana. And since this is a rally, let me give you one choboy. That is our greeting. So choboy. And let me say that 
it is important for all the world to realize that we are in a public health crisis. Vaccines are important at this time to keep us all safe. As a nurse, I know what my comrades in Ghana, in Africa and across the world are having to face in this pandemic. A lot of our comrades have been infected. We have lost lives. We are looking at over 17,000 of us who have passed on over 100,000 infections and yet we are at the front lines giving the care that is required of us. It has not been easy. And the best that the world can do for us is to make available the vaccines so that each and every country in the world can have vaccines to vaccinate its population. And you know, in Africa, many of the countries are either lower income countries or maybe upper middle income countries. This is not enough. The impact of COVID-19 has been dramatic and most countries are beginning to pick the pieces and to add on the purchase of vaccines at high prices is a dent on the world giants, the developed countries and the pharmaceutical companies. It is not easy. And let me say that many countries within the Africa region and in fact, within West Africa, I yet to see the vaccines. In Ghana, we have gotten some vaccines through the COVID system, but this is not enough. It is not enough. We need every government to ensure that we get the waiver from the TRIPS agreement and that nobody stops or nobody blocks the TRIPS waiver such that the technology available can be shared with all countries and we can all develop these vaccines for easy access for our populations. Indeed, we have the expertise, we have the scientists in various countries. What stops us from sharing? How can you call yourself a world giant if you cannot share knowledge related to vaccine production? It is not enough to be a world giant if you cannot share. The world powers must show leadership and must show leadership by making sure that this technology is made available. It is about time that everyone, each and every one of us support this cause. And that is why we support the People's Vaccine Alliance in saying that we must put people before profit. What is profit if you lose your life and die? What is all this money to the world if we cannot save humanity? If I'm not safe, you are not safe. So it's, it's about time that we ensure that the vaccines that are being hoarded, some countries have vaccines that are way over the populations in their country. What are they keeping the vaccines for? They should make it available for countries that do not have it so that we can all get the vaccines and the world can be saved. Humanity can be saved. And let us put people first, humans first before profit. It is very important. So another chow boy, and let us keep on in the solidarity and ensure that our voices are heard. Chow boy, thank you very much for listening. Brilliant, thank you. Um, one of one of the strange things about a virtual rally is we don't all. I'm sure we're all cheering in a in a, in a basis of, of work. <laughs> like, but yeah, I'm definitely cheering, and uh, just, let's just imagine a huge crowd and everyone shouting because I think that was fantastic. And. Uh, uh, it will be people power that makes the difference. Um, now we're going to hear from uh, Senator uh, Ivan Cepeda. He's a Colombian senator. He founded the Movement of Victims of State Crimes, which distinguished him as one of the country's most influential moral authorities on the left. He served in the House of Representatives between 2010 and 2014 and was elected senator for the Democratic uh, Polo Party in July 2014. Um, unfortunately, uh, Senator Cepeda was unable to attend, but he sent a video message, uh, which is going to be read in, which is in Spanish, and then afterwards I will read you the uh, translation. So let's hear from him. Un saludo muy especial desde Colombia. Eh, para que en mi país se logre la inmunidad de la población en un año, se requiere que cada día sean vacunadas 200 mil personas. Hoy estamos en menos de 14.000 diarias, lo que significa que ni siquiera el personal de salud ha podido ser inmunizado. 
Eh, esto tiene una grave repercusión eh, para la situación global del país. Hay una recesión económica que profundiza el desempleo y la pobreza. Por eso quiero hoy eh, reiterar mi llamado a la Organización Mundial del Comercio para que suspenda los derechos de propiedad intelectual sobre las vacunas contra el COVID-19. Esto es una necesidad imperiosa. Requerimos que en los países en desarrollo se puedan fortalecer los programas nacionales de vacunación para así poder también reactivar muy pronto la economía. So I'm just going to read your translation um, for those of you whose Spanish is as bad as mine. Uh, I send you very warm greetings from Colombia. In order to achieve immunity for the whole population of Colombia within, within one year, it is necessary to vaccinate 200,000 people a day. Currently, we are vaccinating less than 14,000 a day. This means that not even health workers have been able to get immunized yet. This has serious repercussions for the overall situation in the country. There is an economic recession which deepens unemployment and poverty. So I want to reiterate here my demand that the World Trade Organization suspends intellectual property rights on COVID-19 vaccine. This is urgently needed so that developing countries can strengthen their national vaccination programs and thereby restart their economies as soon as possible. That's the message from Colombia. But now I'm uh, uh, very honored to introduce the most reverend Dr. Tarbo Cecil Macoba, uh, who's the Archbishop of Cape Town and Metropolitan of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa since 2008. He has a PhD from the University of Cape Town and is also uh, the current Chancellor of the University of the Western Cape. Real privilege to introduce you and to hear from you now, uh, Archbishop. Thank you so much, uh, Max, and um, thank you for this opportunity to appeal to companies and governments in high-income countries for a more equitable approach to the coronavirus pandemic. We're calling for these companies and governments to support the proposal to suspend the patents at the World Trade Organization. These companies are asked to share their technical know-how, as Fatima said, so that the production of vaccines can be ramped up to reach everyone urgently everywhere. The foundation which promotes the legacy of Desmond Tutu last week quoted a research by Duke University in the United States, which says that while high income countries represent less than 16% of the world's population, 16%, they currently hold 60% of the vaccines that have been purchased so far. How can it be moral or ethical that less than a fifth of the world's people have access to more than half of its vaccine supplies? To me, that sounds like not just vaccine nationalism, but vaccine apartheid. Just as Black South Africans were told under apartheid, or African Americans were told in the 19th century, the disparity tells us that we are not fully human, that our lives are not of the same value as the lives of those in the global north. The pharmaceutical industry can come up with all rationalization they like about the cost of the vaccines and the importance of respecting patents. But how can the matter of life and death be computed in dollars and euros and pounds. And it is not just a matter of ethics or charity. South Africa's Dr. Salim Abdul Karim, the joint winner with Dr. Fauci of the John Maddox Prize, has said that it is nonsensical to think that 
you can control the virus by creating islands of safety. The more the virus transmits, the greater the risk of new variants, and countries have, that have inoculated all their people could find their gains short-lived if the virus spreads uncontrolled in other parts of the world. The virus does not respect borders. It does not respect creeds nor race. And as Dr. Karim says, we already have a solution in COVAX, the international financing mechanism for COVAX-19 vaccines, which if fully implemented, will enable all countries to be vaccinated at a similar rate. The Tutu Foundation again says, at the current rates of inoculation, it is estimated that it will take seven years to vaccinate 75% of the global population and reach the immunity the world so desperately needs. We have to do better than this. We can do better than this. And friends, we can't be silent in the face of vaccine racism and vaccine apartheid. And if I was still the younger Tabo Makoba, I would have ended by saying, Amandla. Thank you. <laughs> I, think, I think the old Archbishop can still say that too, and it will still be just as powerful. Uh, thank you very much for your rousing words. I think it, it, I think this key question of ambition, the imagination to feel that we can vaccinate everyone who needs to be vaccinated. And as the COVAX facility, which we hear so much about, uh, is a good thing, but their ambition is at best to vaccinate two in 10 people in poor countries by the end of this year. That is simply not good enough. We need to do better. And we will only do that if we smash down the barriers of intellectual property. Now, our next speaker really doesn't need much introduction. Um, you've probably heard of him. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders is serving his third term in the US Senate after winning re-election in 2018. His previous 16 years in the House of Representatives makes him the longest serving independent member of Congress in American history. He is a member of the Senate Budget Committee, and the Environment and Public Works Committee, where he has focused on global warming and rebuilding national infrastructure. And he's also like a total hero. So um, if we are gonna hand over to an amazing video message from Bernie now. Thank you very much for allowing me to say a few words to you today uh, on this issue of enormous importance to all of us uh, in every country on earth. As you know, one year ago, on March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 outbreak to be a global pandemic. Since that day, our lives have changed in ways that we could not have imagined. In order to slow the virus down, we have been painfully separated from our families and from our friends. Many have lost jobs and struggled to provide basic necessities for their kids amid this lockdown. Worldwide, over 116 million people have been infected and more than two and a half million people have died from this virus. Here in the United States, we have lost over half a million people and many of those who have survived will continue to endure its lingering effects for many years. One thing that this pandemic has shown us beyond any doubt is that we are all in this together. This virus does not respect borders. The only way we are going to get through this crisis is to do everything we can to make sure that a vaccine is available to all people around the world as quickly as humanly possible. Let me be very clear by stating the obvious. Vaccinations work and are responsible for reducing the incidence of and even eliminating many dangerous but preventable diseases. And that is why I am here today to announce my strong support for the movement to create a people's vaccine as an essential step in containing and ending the COVID-19 
pandemic. The U.S. government, that is the American taxpayer, has invested billions of dollars to speed the development and the manufacturing of COVID-19 vaccines. Thus far, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, has granted emergency use authorization to vaccines manufactured by Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. It is anticipated that additional vaccines will receive this authorization soon. To my mind, we must continue to support publicly funded medical research and the work of our public health agencies to find new ways to prevent and treat COVID-19. But we must also make sure that the benefits are broadly shared by the taxpayers who paid for them, not just the wealthy few. It is unconscionable that amid a global health crisis, huge multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical companies continue to prioritize profits by protecting their monopolies and driving up prices rather than prioritizing the lives of people everywhere, including in the global South. Our government has invested enormous sums of taxpayer dollars into the production of these technologies. All people should benefit, not just a few already obscenely wealthy CEOs and shareholders in the wealthiest country on earth. We need a people's vaccine, not a profit vaccine. President Biden and his foreign policy team have repeatedly made it clear that the United States should play a major role in promoting global cooperation and innovation. They have said that after the reckless foreign policy of the Trump years, that, and I quote President Biden, America is back, end quote. Well, I believe that a very good way to demonstrate that American values are back is for the United States to play a leading role in facilitating the production and delivery of these life-saving vaccines and in sharing the innovative technologies for producing them. And that is why today I am sending a letter to the Biden administration to support a proposal to waive vaccine-related intellectual property rights at the World Trade Organization so that we can rapidly expand supplies of vaccines. Ending this pandemic requires collaboration, solidarity, and empathy. It requires a very different mindset, a mindset that puts people over profits at every turn. The pharmaceutical companies must not block this effort, and I join you in your request to temporarily waive WTO intellectual property protections on COVID-19 medical technologies during the pandemic. Transferring these life-saving technologies is not just about responding to this pandemic. It's about preparing for the next one. And we know the next pandemic is not a matter of if, but when. Please know that I am an ally in your efforts to guarantee that all citizens in every country on earth, rich or poor, have access to this vaccine. Thank you again for inviting me, and I look forward to working with you to do everything we can to protect every person on this planet until this pandemic is over. Thank you very much. Brilliant, fabulous message from Bernie then. Um, right, and now our final speaker is an oh, amazing politician and activist here in, here in the UK. Excuse the screaming in the background, that's my children going to bed. Um, Caroline Lucas is the Member of Parliament for Brighton Pavilion. She served as leader of the Green Party of England and Wales from 2008 to 2012 and co-leader from 2016 to 2018. From, two, from 1999 to 2010, she served as one of the party's first MEPs and represented the South East region till becoming the UK's first Green MP. Caroline was also a former head of policy at Oxfam, so she comes from a fantastic pedigree. Um, and she's an amazing and relentless champion for progressive causes and a, a real champion of the people's vaccine. So Caroline, over to you. 
Thank you so much, Max, for that uh, incredibly kind uh, introduction. I'm so honored to join all of you here tonight. It's one year now since the WHO declared coronavirus a pandemic. And during these most extraordinary 12 months, scientists have achieved the incredible feat of creating a number of vaccines to deal with this deadly disease. But they've done so thanks to unprecedented levels of public funding, thanks to the participation of tens of thousands of trial volunteers, thanks to the work of overstretched health services like the NHS here in Britain, and thanks to health workers right across the world. In other words, developing these vaccines and indeed controlling the virus more generally has been a collective effort. And yet the fruits of our collective efforts have been handed over to a group of gigantic corporations, some of which are making a fortune off the back of these vaccines. Now that not only perpetuates existing inequalities, it has created whole new previously unimaginable levels of discrimination, which have shocked the whole world. Truly a vaccine apartheid, as many of my fellow panelists here tonight have described it. And yet I'm sad to say the government of my own country is still putting corporate interests ahead of saving lives on a global basis. Now it's true that the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced at a G7 meeting two weeks ago that he would be donating vaccines to countries around the world in order to redress this inequality. Now that might sound generous, and after all, Britain has bought many times more vaccines than we could possibly use. So I've been trying to pin him down in Parliament on what that promise actually amounts to in practice. And what I've discovered is shocking, that the promised donations will not be made until we're absolutely sure that we have no use for any further vaccines here in the UK, something that isn't likely to happen for many months. That the donations will only be taken from the government's share of COVAX vaccines, not from the vast pool of vaccines that we've bought bilaterally. And perhaps worst of all, these might not be donations at all. The government might well expect payment for these vaccines. Now, so much for the largesse of the British government. But should we really be having to rely on charity anyway to achieve the global vaccination rates that, let's not forget, are required to make everyone safe? As the South African government recently told the World Trade Organization, the problem with philanthropy is that it cannot buy equality. Well, that's what we're here tonight to argue for, to argue for equality and for justice. You can't have equality when power is in the hands of a small minority of the world's population. And you can't have equality when power is in the hands of a small number of multinational corporations. If we want true equality and justice, we need systems change. We cannot allow our remarkable collective effort in this pandemic to be reduced to an opportunity for a few to profit. Vaccine equity matters too much for us to allow privatization to steal it away. And that's why I'm so delighted to be part of this distinguished panel and campaign. We're really building something extraordinary. You know, I remember back in my days as a member of the European Parliament, how difficult it was to get people interested in the minutiae of TRIPS and the WTO. You know, these were just acronyms that nobody understood, trade-related intellectual property rights. Well, thanks to this campaign, we've made it a major news story in just a few months. 66 MPs in the UK Parliament have now signed a motion backing the proposal from South Africa and India for a TRIPS waiver at the WTO. So if you're listening from the UK, please ask your MP to sign it. And so intense is the pressure growing, we might perhaps see some compromises from Northern governments this week. And if we do, let's bank it, but let's also keep going for the really big goal, a medical system based on collaboration, on sharing, on putting the health of people all around the world ahead of narrow self-interest. Now such a health system could transform the world, eradicating so many diseases, transforming the lives of millions of people. That's how big the prize is here. So what you're already achieving is incredible and I'm really thrilled to be part of it. Good luck and solidarity to everyone. Thank you, Caroline. That was a fabulous, uh, uh, fabulous ending. And I think the point you make there about um, history will look back on this moment 
we often see substantial change in the world as a result of crises, whether they're wars, whether they're pandemics. I think this could see the beginning of a real change in the way the world looks at healthcare and the way that we invest in keeping the world healthy if we fight hard enough to break this crazy system that puts profit, that puts where we see way more invested in drugs like Viagra than we do in cures for malaria or other tropical diseases. We, it's a twisted system. And I think this is just one classic example of, of that happening. So we need to fight hard to break through on this issue of COVID-19 vaccines, but also lay the foundations for a, a truly public system uh, of healthcare for the world. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody for uh, the, all the speakers. What an amazing lineup. That was really, really exciting and inspiring. And I hope you all uh, are leaving feeling inspired and wanting to do more. Um, ask you all to follow the People's Vaccine uh, Twitter account. Use the hashtag. Uh, especially tomorrow, we've got the uh, Day of Action and many, many things going on. We've got demonstrations uh, going on in the US outside the uh, key pharmaceutical giants like Pfizer. Pfizer is such an evil company. They, they invented the idea of trips and intellectual property in the first place to defend their, their monopolies and they're doing it again. So we're gonna see people demonstrating outside Pfizer and the other big pharmaceutical companies tomorrow. Lots going on and you can see it all on the website. It's in the chat. Please connect up and do whatever you can. And every little bit helps, as we said, the, there is huge public support for what we're fighting for here. It, leaders are ignoring the will of the people. Even uh, in every single poll we've done, even the supporters of the, the Republican Party, conservatives in the UK, and supporters of Emmanuel Macron, a huge numbers support action to overcome patents, to face down pharmaceutical companies, and to deliver a people's vaccine and not a profit vaccine. I really think we can win this one, but we have to fight collectively and fight hard in the next few months. These are very, very powerful actors with a lot of influence, but we've beaten them before and we can beat them again. So thank you everyone for joining. Please follow the People's Vaccine, join in as much as you can. And uh, brilliant, enjoy your evenings and rest of your days. And thank you for joining us, thank you. Thank you.